Did somebody say something? Oh. Yeah, welcome to the 2020 Aspen Center for Physics, hence our PECOS Physics Talks, an online version of the series usually offered at the center. We are pleased that so many of you uh, have found your way to the talk this evening. If you did not receive the email of the lecture schedule or the description of tonight's lecture, this is available on our website, aspenphysics.org. You can also be added, you can be added to our mailing list by contacting to the center. This series of talks will be live online every Thursday evening at 5.30 Mountain Daylight Time through August and posted on YouTube the following day. So it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Letta Engelhardt from MIT. Letta got her PhD in 2016 from UC Santa Barbara. She was a postdoc fellow at Princeton University before joining MIT as a faculty in the fall of 2019. While well, only three years out of her PhD, Netta already made many important contributions to our understanding of quantum gravity and the black holes. So let me just uh, 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 quickly mention a couple of things. In 2014, with Aaron Wall, she proposed the concept of quantum extremal surfaces, which has provided an important tool for obtaining fine-grained quantum information uh, properties of uh, uh, many quantum gravitational systems. And in 2015, with Raphael Busso, she proved a new area theorem in general relativity. Such area theorems in general relativity are few and far between. Actually, the only one before was by Stephen Hawking in 1972. So Hawking's theorem said that the area of the black holes, even the horizon, always increases with time. So I don't have time here to explain um, Nata's version of the theorem here, except to say that it actually overcame an important conceptual defect in Hawking's version of the theorem, because the Hawking was concerning, uh, concerned about the black hole even the horizon. But, the even horizon, but to define an even horizon actually requires the knowledge of all future development of the universe. So their version of the theorem uh, um, avoided this problem. And then in last year, with Air Mary Marov and Maxfield, she made a breakthrough in addressing Hawking's um, more than 40 years old uh, information, uh, black hole information, uh, black hole information loss paradox. By applying the quantum extremal surface techniques she developed earlier to an evaporating black hole, they established an important support uh, uh, for the utility of black hole information. Uh, 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 of the black hole evolution. So during the first talk, we will um, you will not be able to uh, you will be muted. Um, but if you have questions, you can raise your hands by clicking. Uh, um, yeah, by, by clicking the hands uh, uh, at the say participant. Uh, lead, uh, yeah, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, uh, I will call you uh, during the Q and A session. So we will wrap up by 6.30. And we would also like to know that your video image may be included in the YouTube posting. So if you don't, be, if you don't wish to be seen, so you can turn your uh, video off. Now, without further ado, let me turn the stage to Professor Let uh, uh, Angelhardt. Thank you very much, Hong, for a really lovely introduction. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be in Aspen, even if it's only virtually. And uh, I'm really excited to tell you all about uh, the black hole information paradox. So with that, let me uh, share my slides. This will only take a moment, hopefully. All right. I'm assuming everybody can see this. If you can't, please uh, let me know. So the black hole information paradox, um, why am I so excited to tell you about it? Well, it's a, it's a problem about fundamental physics, which has been around for about 45 years at this point. And as all problems on fundamental physics are concerned, this is a topic of uh, serious fascination for us physicists. Now in the past year, there's been a, a lot of fascinating developments moving quite rapidly. 
And so I felt bold enough to add a second part to the title, a resolution on the horizon. But there's a question mark there, which is to designate that we haven't quite solved the problem yet, but we have indeed come very far. So let me begin by talking about the main subject, black hole information paradox. What is it? And why do we care about it? My goal in this lecture is going to be to explain what it is, explain why it's important, and tell you what strides we have made over the past year that are so exciting and so interesting and where we're moving forwards with this. So black hole information paradox has three phrases in it. There is black hole, and that is something that sounds like Einstein's theory of general relativity. Black holes are gravitational objects. Gravity is described by Einstein's theory of general relativity. Now, general relativity is a, a really great theory. It has been tested many times, and it has uh, come out winning in every single one of the tests that we have conducted on it. The second phrase in here is information. Now, information can mean a lot of different things in different contexts. In the context that we are considering here in particular, we mean quantum information. This is information which is specific to quantum mechanics. And so this third construct here is quantum, quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a theory of things that are very, very small, like electrons and uh, protons. And so here we have these two theories. Quantum mechanics is just as good as general relativity in the sense that it's also been tested innumerable times. And it has, again, uh, given the correct predictions each and every time. And the last phrase that we have here is paradox, which is when two things that appear to be true end up giving you two contradictory answers. And as you might have guessed, that's exactly what happens here. We have Einstein's theory of general relativity and we have quantum mechanics. Both theories appear to be true and yet they do not agree. So the black hole information paradox is a problem that confronts the quantum nature of our universe the fact that we have that, that electrons and protons, these are all ruled by quantum mechanics with general relativity, which described the universe at large. Now, quantum mechanics and general relativity are both theories of the extreme. Quantum mechanics describes really small things, as I said. So here, I've drawn a, uh, a little atom uh, with an electron cloud around it. Some associations you might have with quantum mechanics subatomic particles, quantum computers, some really weird movie plots. And on the other hand, we have general relativity. Really large things may think stars, galaxies, black holes, maybe wormholes like the one behind me. Again, really weird movie plots. And so looking at this, at these two theories of the extreme, you might wonder if quantum mechanics only tells you things about really small stuff, and general relativity only tells you things about really large stuff, then why on earth would you worry about the two theories contradicting one another? Clearly, one applies to small things and one applies to large things, and they don't have anything to do with one another. And the point is that I've omitted two very important words in this slide. Quantum mechanics apply to things with small size, and general relativity applies to things with large mass. And so you might imagine that maybe you take something that's just very, very massive, a planet or a star, and you condense it, you squeeze it down until it becomes really, really small. And if you have maybe seen something in Scientific American or NOVA, you know that if you take a star and you squeeze it until it's really small, you get a black hole. And that's something that has an enormous amount of mass, so general relativity applies, but squeezed into a really tiny space, so quantum mechanics does too. And so here we have a regime, a situation, where quantum mechanics and general relativity both have something to say. And so we need a theory that can simultaneously describe the quantum and gravity. And that is what we call quantum gravity. And quantum gravity can describe things like 
the Big Bang. Or for example, what might happen in a really, really enormous particle collider. And here I've drawn it as if it's coming way out into space because you really need something huge. Or, as is particularly relevant for this lecture, inside of a black hole. So quantum gravity applies to all of these, of these very extreme regimes where two theories that might, at the face of it, have nothing to do with one another, both apply. Now, we don't understand quantum gravity very well yet, but we look for it because when we do understand it, we will be able to explain how the universe started. Does before the Big Bang actually make sense? What happens when you jump into a black hole? And let me emphasize this. Black holes, for example, exist. Something happens when you jump into one. And so as physicists, we had better be able to explain what it is that happens. Without that, our theory of the universe is incomplete. Now, these are all fascinating questions. And usually when things are really interesting, unfortunately, they happen to be very hard. And so quantum gravity is indeed, it's hard. One of the things that make it difficult is that we don't have empirical data. And so you could ask, how do we get around this? How do we get around the issue of not having empirical data? How do we do research in quantum gravity? What's, what's our approach? And so one strategy which has worked uh, many times before, and in fact is how general relativity was first discovered, is instead of actual experiments, we do thought experiments. We say, okay, we have some system and we want to ask questions about it. For example, I have a black hole. What would general relativity tell me happens in this black hole? What would quantum mechanics tell me, tell me happens inside this black hole? And if, if the two answers contradict, then we've got ourselves a paradox. Now, I say that like it's a good thing. And it's actually a really good thing. We love paradoxes because paradoxes tell us when we're thinking about something the wrong way. Something happens when, when you jump into a black hole and the fact that we get a paradox means that we are simply unable to describe it with what we currently know, which means that this is the place where we need to look if we want to truly understand what is going on. It is telling us that we are approaching the problem wrong, that we have the wrong framework, that something is missing and it's telling us where to look. Now, maybe I make it sound easy. And so just to disabuse you of that notion, this particular paradox of the black hole information has been around for 45 years. So it's been around for quite a while and it's a very difficult paradox to solve. Now back to what it is. It is a contradiction, as I said before, between the predictions of general relativity and quantum mechanics, specifically inside of a black hole. So, Essentially, we don't know what happens because the two theories do not agree with one another. Now, I want to tell you in more detail what it is, exactly this paradox is. And so to do that, I'm going to delve a little bit more into both general relativity and quantum mechanics, starting with general relativity. So what is the basic idea behind general relativity? Is that mass curves space and time. So here on the screen, I've drawn a, the fabric of space-time, as we whimsically call it, with some very, very large mass, which is curving it all down upwards. Now, black holes, of course, are what we're interested in. And a black, so a black hole is something that concentrates so much mass into so little room that it curves space and time to the point where nothing, not even light, can escape it. To give you an idea of the kind of magnitude that we're talking about here, let me give you some numbers. So a black hole, which is 1,000 times the mass of Mount Everest, would be the size of a single virus cell, of a single virus unit. So that's a huge amount of mass in a tiny space. It's incredibly dense. Now, that intuition aside, if I were giving this talk in front of a room full of people, I would ask a question. How many of you have heard that black holes curve space-time so much to the point where nothing can escape. And I'll bet many of you would raise your hands. This is a lore that we've heard before. But do we really understand what that means and where that comes from? And that, it's a very strange no notion. So I want to go a little bit more into detail on that. 
The point is that this comes down to something that is a fundamental aspect of relativity, which is that nothing travels faster than light. So here we have a, uh, a cartoon, which is hopefully going to aid in the understanding. So here we say, not everything the light touches is your future. What do I mean by that? Well, if nothing travels faster than light, surely we can't travel faster than light, which means that Anywhere we can go to, anything we can do, is within the realm of where light can travel to. To be more precise, here I have drawn a cone. This cone is meant to be a symbolic representation of something. You imagine that there is a person, maybe you are sitting at the tip of this cone. Everything inside the cone represents the places where light can travel to. In other words, everything that is a possibility within your future and everything outside the cone, light can't get there. And so you, always being, always traveling more slowly than light, cannot get there either. So that shadowy place, you can never go there. You can never go outside of the cone because the cone represents everywhere that light or something slower than light can go to. So with that basic intuition in mind, that the cone represents everything, all of the possibilities of what you can do, where you can go in your future, being constrained by the fact that you cannot travel faster than light. Let's see what happens inside of a black hole. So what does this diagram represent? Well, in this diagram, we're imagining that time is running upwards, meaning what we're, we're looking at this diagram, there's this blob, this round blob. This represents a planet or a star. As you move upwards, the star is shrinking. This means that it is collapsing in on itself. And so it's the same mass, but it's getting smaller and smaller and forming a black hole. The gray area, the gray surface that you see here is the event horizon, the boundary of the black hole. And as the star collapses further and further and further, taking all of this mass and concentrating it in a region which is smaller and smaller, eventually space-time is so curved, you have an, an infinite amount of curvature. In other words, all of this mass is being concentrated in the space of zero volume. This is what we call the singularity. That's this jagged line inside of the event horizon. So now let's take a look at these cones of light. If you're outside of the black hole on the rightmost cone, then you're sitting again at the tip of this cone and everything which is inside of the cone is your future. And the shadowy region, everything outside of it, you'd have to travel faster than light to get there. Now, the key point here is that gravity, or in particular, a black hole is so massive and so dense, it warps space-time so much that it causes these cones to tilt. And so if you look at the cone, which has an edge shared with the event horizon, you see if you are sitting at the tip of that cone, your entire future is inside the black hole. You have no future outside of it. And the only way you did is if you could travel faster than light. This is why everything that goes into the black hole must reach the singularity. Because the singularity is not a place in space. It's not the center of the black hole. It is its future. And you cannot run away from your own future. So this is the basic idea of why things cannot get out of a black hole. Nothing can escape from a black hole. That is essentially all we need to get to the black hole part of the black hole information paradox. And so we are ready to move on to the information part, which I'll remind you is quantum mechanics. The basic premise of quantum mechanics is that the universe is probabilistic. And as a result of that, it can be very confusing. So to quote Richard Feynman, Anyone who claims to understand quantum mechanics is either crazy or lying. Nevertheless, quantum mechanics really does describe our universe and has been tested many times in many experiments. And so despite being confusing and strange, it nevertheless appears to be true. So as a warm up exercise, we're going to begin with a thought experiment. I told you these were useful. We're going to begin not with quantum mechanics, but with ordinary, ordinary mechanics. A classical mechanics, as we call it, or just classical world, which distinguishes it from quantum. 
So let's imagine that we have a so-called classical coin. Again, this classical here only serves to distinguish it from a quantum coin, which will come later. If you have a classical coin, the kind of coin that you find in your wallet, and you imagine this coin sits inside a treasure chest. Somebody put it there. You don't know how they put it there. And so assuming that it's a fair coin, it has a 50% chance of being heads and a 50% chance of being tails. Now suppose that you open, the, open this box, open the treasure chest, and you find heads. This is not what in quantum mechanics we call a measurement of the system. So we say the state of the coin is heads. Now if you have a thousand treasure chests, all prepared in the exact same way, so the same person prepared them in the exact same way, placed the coin in the exact same way on all of these treasure chests, then you will find that all 1,000 coins are heads. Just that that's how the world works, right? So that's our thought experiment for the classical coin. Let's move on now to the quantum coin. So suppose now you have a quantum coin in a chest. What does that mean? Well, it means that the outcome of our measurements is probabilistic. So if we have a thousand coins inside of these 1,000 chests and we have a 50% chance of getting heads and a 50% chance of getting tails for each one of these coins, then when we measure these, we will find 500 heads and we will find 500 tails, even though all of the coins were prepared in the exact same way. We say that the state of the coin is heads and tails. It is 50% heads and it is 50% tails at the same time. Now, many of you may have heard about this type of thought experiment as the Schrodinger cat experiment in which we ask whether a cat is alive or dead. And you say that it's alive and dead at the same time. In the interest of not harming animals in this talk, I've decided to use coins. But those of you who are familiar with this experiment, it is essentially the same one. So the upshot, a quantum coin can be both heads and, and tails at the same time. Both of them, not one or the other, not just because we haven't looked at it, but because it literally is heads and tails. We can also have a loaded quantum coin, an unfair quantum coin. Maybe it's 80% heads and 20% tails. What does that mean? It means that if we measure 1,000 boxes prepared in the exact same way, we will find 800 heads and 20 and 200 tails. What's the basic upshot of this, of this coins being heads and tails at the same time? Well, one thing that it tells you is that a single measurement doesn't actually tell you anything about the state of a quantum coin. If I just open one box and I look at one coin, and I see, okay, this one is heads. It doesn't tell me if the state of the quantum coin is 50% heads and 50% tails, or maybe 1% heads and 99% tails, or maybe something else altogether. It doesn't tell me anything. However, a lot of measurements will essentially tell you everything about the state of the quantum coin. What that means is you can get all of the information that you want about the quantum coin with just enough measurements. If you look at a thousand boxes, you can do an arbitrarily large number of boxes, all prepared in the exact same way, and you measure, I mean, which is to say you look at the coin in each one of these, you can determine the state of the coin, what percentage it is heads, and what percentage it is tails. Now, I'm sure this is all crystal clear and not confusing at all, so let's complicate it a little bit. Let's suppose that we have two quantum coins inside a treasure chest. Now we have four possibilities. Since these are both in the same treasure chest, then we have, we have, we have to take into account both of them. So we could have heads and heads, we could have heads and tails, we could have tails and heads, or we could have tails and tails. These are all the four possibilities and we have two coins in the same treasure chest. And it is in fact this, that gives rise to what Einstein found so objectionable about quantum mechanics, which is what he termed spooky action at a distance. So suppose that we have a loaded pair of quantum coins. What does that mean? 
That means that instead of being equal percentage for all four of these, meaning you have an equal chance of getting one of these four, instead we're going to say, suppose you have a 50% chance of getting heads, heads, and a 50% chance of getting tails, tails. Well, if you open the treasure chest and you find that the first coin is heads, then that means that the other coin stops being heads and tails and immediately becomes just heads. This is because if you know that the first coin is heads, then that means you've excluded the possibility that you have tails, tails. When this happens, we say that there is entanglement between the two coins. That means that they're correlated with one another in a certain way, and they depend on one another. And this is precisely what, this is what Einstein found so objectionable in that you could make a measurement on one of these coins and it affects the other, even if the other is very far away. As strange as this might be, this is actually, this phenomenon has been observed and detected and exists in the universe, this spooky action at a distance. It's a fundamental part of quantum mechanics. So let's talk a little bit more about entanglement. We have this 50% heads, heads, and 50% tails, tails. Now, entanglement is this relation between the two points. It's important is the way in which they are related to one another. If you just measure coin one, or if you just measure coin two, without knowing that they are entangled, that there is entanglement between them, then you miss out on crucial information about how they're correlated. This is the information that is going to appear in the black hole information paradox. So when two particles are entangled, making measurements about just one of the two particles misses information. Now we have talked about general relativity and black holes. We'll talk, we've talked about information as something which is present in the entanglement of particles. And now, we are ready to talk about the paradox. And we're going to begin with a fact, which is that pairs of entangled particles are popping in and out of existence all the time. These are just like the coins, but now they're particles. Coins are just an analogy. Now, the fact that these are popping in and out of existence all the time all over the universe means that they can also pop into existence across the event horizons of black holes. So here I've got myself a, a black hole. Again, this is the fabric of space-time curving around a very massive object. And I'm imagining that I have these, uh, again, it's a thought experiment. I have these two coins, and they're entangled with one another. So one of them is outside of the black hole. One of them is inside of the black hole. The one that's inside the black hole falls in, and the one that's outside of the black hole just flies off. The outgoing coin, the one that flies off, carries away energy. We call this radiation or Hawking radiation after Stephen Hawking. The black hole loses energy and as a consequence it shrinks and eventually it evaporates altogether. So we had two coins, one of them went into the black hole then it disappeared uh, and we're left with this one last coin. Let's take a look at the coin that flew away. And by take a look, I mean, let's measure it. Let's see what we get. Well, we get heads, let's say. But what about the coin that ended up inside the black hole? Do we retain any information about the relation between this one and the one that flew into the black hole? Well, remember this, when two particles are entangled, making measurements about just one of these two particles misses information. And so, to determine the full information about the two-coin system, we need to measure the second coin. But the second coin went into a black hole and the black hole disappeared. And there is no observer in the universe who can measure coin two, because coin two went into a black hole, and the, but the black hole is now gone. You might have said, well, if it went into a black hole and the black hole didn't disappear, maybe you can jump in after it and try to measure it and retain some of that entanglement. But the black hole is gone. It's disappeared. 
So it would appear that we have lost information. And in 1976, Stephen Hawking showed that because of quantum entanglement, the disappearance of point two from the universe is a net loss of information. I want to pause here because this is a catastrophic result. Physics is meant to be a predictive and postdictive science. And what that means is that given all of the information about the universe today, we have to be able to predict what happens to the universe in a thousand years, in a billion years, and also to say what happened a thousand years ago and a billion years ago. Now suppose that some 1,000 years ago, a black hole evaporated, taking that second coin with it, and the information was lost. Then given what we know today, we have no way of recreating that information about that lost coin, at least according to Stephen Hawking's calculation. And so it's, it's catastrophic for the post-activity of physics. But there is an even sharper paradox here. So let's compare. Well, the basic assumption is one that gravity and quantum mechanics both agree on. Black holes evaporate. Now, general relativity says that after evaporation, information about the second coin is irrevocably lost. And so, sorry, this here is the wrong state, sorry about that. Um, quantum mechanics says that there is no process in the universe that can ever lose information. So here is the paradox. According to quantum mechanics, the information is somehow conserved. And according to general relativity, it is lost. Now, this here, this is the paradox. This is the paradox that I promised you, the black hole information paradox. Now, remember, paradoxes give us a hint of how to modify our theories so that they describe nature properly. So why do we care about this one? Let's remind ourselves. We care about this one because this one is telling us about quantum gravity. And quantum gravity is going to tell us about the Big Bang and about black holes, about the black hole interior. In addition to, as a plus, resolving a predictive and postdictive catastrophe for physics. So black hole information paradox. What it is, well, now we know. And why we care about it, well, we know that too. We want to, we want to understand what happened at the Big Bang. We want to understand what happens in the black hole interior. So what now? Where are we now? And what is so exciting about this past year? Well, let's ask, what is missing? If we wanted to resolve the black hole information paradox, what do we really need? Well, a quantum theory of gravity, it would be nice. Understanding the interplay between gravity and entanglement. Clearly, that is where something is going wrong. We have gravity and we have entanglement, and there's some problem there. So understanding this interplay is also crucial. And finally, we also need to understand this process of black hole evaporation. And so in May 2019, these two papers came out at, on the same day, uh, one by Jeff Pennington and one by Ahmed Anhari, myself, Don Merrill, and Henry Maxfield. And these two papers essentially put all of these three ingredients together. A, so, some insight, some input from quantum gravity, some insight that about the way that gravity and entanglement are related to one another, and also some insight about how black holes evaporate. So what is the upshot of this? The upshot is that gravity contributes to entanglement in a very particular way. The way that gravity contributes to entanglement in a black hole that evaporates it's just enough to offset the loss of information due to the evaporation process. So what this means is that if you correctly account for the way that gravity affects entanglement, for the, in some sense, the entanglement of gravity, if you do it just right, then you get a smoking gun signal that information is conserved. Now, so far, I haven't told you how this works. And to be completely fair, in our calculation, we, we calculated it and we found that it works, but we didn't know why. And there was a follow-up after that. 
which aim to answer the question, in what, in what way does gravity do this, account for this entanglement in a way that just, just saves the day? And again, we still don't understand, but we understand better now, thanks to a number of developments, especially in this past fall and winter, where a crucial ingredient appears to be a very unusual type of wormhole. Now, a wormhole, as is on the screen or behind me, is a space-time connection between what you could think of as two parallel universes. And so this very exotic type of wormholes appear to show us a way in which gravity is actually making up or fixing this apparent loss of information. Confused? Well, so are we. We essentially have a proverbial black box. It tells us this is the correct answer and that wormholes play a very important role, this exotic wormholes. But um, that's, uh, we want to look inside the black box. We want to know why, does this, why is this true? Not just that it works, but how it works. We want to understand things like what's inside this black box? Why do these wormholes appear? What is the true underlying mechanism in quantum gravity that, that gives rise to them? And for example, what must we do to coin one to obtain information about coin two? This is where we're going. This is what we need in order to really resolve the black hole information paradox. Now, in my opinion, this is a really exciting time. I think there has never been a more exciting time to work on the black hole information paradox. I might be a little bit biased, but I'm working on it now. But it is an ongoing quest. And we are working on opening this black box. And I think we're closer than ever to resolving the black hole information paradox. Now, let me say a few parting remarks. Resolving the black hole information paradox is a stepping stone to understanding the fundamental building blocks of the cosmos, understanding the Big Bang, understanding what lies inside black holes, and also for answering the question that I would say has fascinated humanity for as long as human thought has existed, which is, where did it all come from? And with that, I will close and uh, ask for questions. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks, that for a great talk. So now we start the Q and A session. Uh, let me let me turn off the slides so I can actually uh, look at people. Yeah. So um, yeah, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Using the using this raise your hand tool uh, uh, of Zoom, then I will call you by order. So I saw a raised hand in terms of video. <laughs> uh, yeah, but not on the uh, on Zoom. Uh, yeah. So Ron James, maybe you can uh, uh, ask. Yeah, Ron James, you want to ask a question? Yep, okay. okay. Uh, so um, I did ask this on a chat, but I didn't understand when you have the two entangled coins, mm -hmm. um, when one goes, I think it was when one goes into the black hole and the other one flies off, yeah. we lose information. Um, uh, do we lose the entanglement? I don't understand what information, and, and, and I think then we measured the, the coin that flies off. If we measure that as heads, why didn't we still know that the coin inside the black hole is heads? So the, if you, so the point is, um, you lose information about the entanglement itself. So let's imagine in a situation where we have two pairs of coins that uh, both are, both of them are across, just across the event horizon of the black hole. And the two coins fall in and two coins get out. And so you might ask, well, which coin is it entangled? Is, is coin one entangled with? And, and you don't know. And the, so the point is, um, you lose information about the very feature of entanglement itself, rather than uh, about the, you, so maybe let me put it this way. The, state of these two of the of an entangled set of coins is more than just the the state of one or the state of the other it's, it's more than the sum of its parts 
And so what you lose when one of these coins falls into the black hole and the black hole evaporates and takes that coin out of the universe is you lose that which was more than the sum of the points. So the information was that the information that we've lost was that the two coins were entangled, that the, that the coin who escaped had an entangled partner. You, you have lost the knowledge of the entanglement. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a lot of raised hand by, um, yeah, I'm not going to pronounce the name very accurately by Sibius. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Ned, uh, thanks very much for the uh, enlightening presentation. Uh, very, very uh, clear, clear, all the concepts. Uh, except that I, I didn't quite get uh, what is so special about these wormhole solutions. It might be a bit of a technical question, especially for this crowd. But how are they different in some way, let's say, from other wormhole solutions that we have in general relativity? And I guess, could you speculate how they may be able to help resolve the... Uh... <laughs> that is a truly excellent question, and I will do my best to, uh, to explain it uh, coherently. So there are two different types of wormholes under discussion. There are so-called uh, space-time wormholes, that um, connect two different universes at the same time. And then there are what we call, um, you could call them uh, spatial wormholes, if you like, which would be connecting, in some sense, um, they would be creating a correlation between two different times. So these are wormholes that travel, you could say, in time as opposed to in space. And one of the ways in which we might uh, ask how does this, what, what bearing does this have on the information paradox? Is it, it has raised the question, uh, it's, you, you can do various calculations and you can say, and, and when, when is this consistent under what type of, uh, of theory? Is it consistent to have these exotic wormholes? And uh, one, one suggestion is really not a single theory, but a collection of theories that Gravity, classical gravity, general relativity might at the end of the day be not one, but many theories. And I, uh, I wish I could explain it better, but unfortunately it's, uh, it's very much a uh, work in progress, I would say. And I think we, we are always better at explaining science when we understand it more. So it's kind of like a piece of the same theory, uh, something like that. Sorry, could you wish to be that you were cut off for a second? Uh, yeah, I was asking if it's if essentially you have multiple copies of the same theory or something like that, or? Um, um, you, you might imagine that you have um, multiple copies of the same theory, but with different types of, uh, so it, yeah, different what we call interactions, in different interaction strengths, you could imagine. So we have, you know, the weak force, the strong force, and we all have different interaction strengths. So you might imagine it's different theories with different interaction strengths, and somehow we take an average over all of them. Got it, got it, okay, yeah. And that, that's sort of what gives us something that looks, looks like uh, general relativity. So, um, David Allen. Yeah, David Allen, did you ask a question? Yeah, 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 David Allen, uh, 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 now you can ask your question. Yes, please. Uh, are there any real world examples of an entangled object, one of which disappears into the wormhole? And secondly, is the energy, which in your model um, is carried away with the, uh, with the, with one coin, why does that, where does that, why does that energy diminish the energy content of the work of the black, black body? Yeah, so regarding your first question, if I understand correctly, you're asking whether we have any real life examples where we've tracked um, the ent an entangled pair across an event horizon. If I understand that's, that's, uh, that's what you're asking. And uh, I believe that the answer is no, but that is, not, um, that is not because, well, we know entanglement works, we know entanglement happens, and we know black holes exist. 
So it's simply a matter of limitations on our ability to observe phenomena at the black hole horizon, and of course to observe things that fall across it. Now, um, remind me, what was your second question again? Oh, sorry, the, the, the energy of the, uh, of the black hole, the black hole diminishing. So what, um, what actually ends up happening is that when you have this, uh, these two particles that, uh, that pop into existence that are entangled, it may sound funny, but the one that goes into the black hole carries negative energy. And the one that, call, that comes out of the black hole carries positive energy. Between the two of them, the total energy could say is zero. But because the negative energy falls into the black hole, uh, the black hole shrinks. Oh, OK. Um, John Palmer? Yes. Two things. Last comment reminds me of antimatter and matter. Is that what you're talking about? Ah, uh, yes. And secondly, is the string theory play anything into this explanation? Does the string theory have anything to do with this explanation? Uh, absolutely. Okay. So uh, this black box that I was talking about is actually a formulation of string theory. So the way this actually works is that we have this um, we have a, a formulation of string theory. Uh, if you you might have heard of it, it's known as ADS CFT. And it is, it's a black box in the sense that we don't really understand too much of the mechanics, but if we sort of feed it a question, we're pretty good at extracting an answer from it without really knowing how that, uh, that works that well. But the important thing is that the answers it feeds us, we expect are coming from string theory. So this resolution of the, uh, this potential, this road towards a resolution of the information paradox um, is, it is within the framework of string theory, at least so far. Okay, so um, so next question by Jordan Fingerman. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, Sheldon. I just unmute it. Right, my question is, um, <clears throat> May I call you Netta? Yes, you may. Okay. What do you think happens if you jump into a black hole? Um, that is an excellent question. Uh, what would you feel if you jumped into a black hole? Um, well, I suppose it depends on the black hole. If you jump into a, a very large black hole, I would imagine that when you jump in, you're the reason that large black holes are in some sense more benign than small black holes is that you are very far from the singularity. The singularities are very far off in the future. So the forces around the black hole are not as violent. So you might, you might live for a little bit, uh, but after, after a while, gener general relativity is to be believed, then you would be torn apart by uh, the force of gravity near the black hole. Now, for a small black hole, the same thing would happen, but much earlier. Now, how does, uh, how does quantum gravity modify this? Well, in, in quantum gravity, what we are coming to realize, or at the very least heavily suspect, is that space and time are not fundamental objects. They're not fundamental variables. Uh, and so eventually, what will happen is space and time itself will break down. Uh, presumably, if, we understand, if our under current understanding is correct, space and time will break down and there'll be some quantum mess. Uh, at that point, of course, a human would be not really be able to feel much if any, or anything at all. But as far as what that quantum mess is and what it looks like, what is a singularity in quantum gravity? Those are all excellent questions and we're working towards them. And of course, the black, resolving the black hole information paradox is going to tell us how we should be thinking about uh, certain aspects of quantum gravity that will help us understand that better. Thank you. Um, Ron James, you have another question? I do. Um, I thought I mentioned before, thanks for an excellent talk, Nella. Um, so two questions. Um, what confidence do we have that wormholes exist? And do we know if time exists inside a black hole? And thanks they, again. Sorry, what was the second question? Do we know if time exists inside a black hole? 
So uh, wormholes are solutions to Einstein's equations. Einstein's equations are something that, um, that essentially but describes general relativity. So if you are willing to just say general relativity must be, must be right, then we say wormholes uh, must exist. Now, I should say that uh, the way that these exotic wormholes contribute to uh, the entanglement calculation that we have done, that is not particularly, is not important, I should say, if they manifest in the real universe or not. It's a sense in which if they're allowed in the theory, if they're allowed as potential possibilities in the theory, that's already good enough. So even if we, they don't form in the real universe as we see it, as long as the theory permits their existence, as long as they're solutions, then that might already be sufficient for us to, um, to use them and for them to be actually take care of the entanglement. Now, what was your second question? Does time exist inside a black hole? Yeah, good. So uh, time it is similar to space, we expect, in quantum gravity, in that it's not a fundamental uh, it's not a fundamental variable in quantum gravity. What we mean by that is the following. So let's, uh, let's imagine you are looking at your, at your desk, perhaps. And uh, your desk, you know, is not truly solid. It's composed of molecules. And, uh, you know, the molecules are not really uh, it either. If you zoom further in, then, uh, then you see atoms. And if you keep on zooming in, you keep on looking at things that are smaller and smaller. And you see things that are progressively more fundamental. Now, you might say, well, at the end of the day, the things that are truly fundamental are just space and time. That's the only thing that's really fundamental. And what we're coming to realize in quantum gravity, at least in, in string theory, is that, that that does not look right. Um, that time itself is something that emerges in the same way that if you look away from all these molecules and you look from afar, what you see is your desk. Your desk emerges from all these molecules, this structure emerges. And so time, is most likely very similar and it emerges from something more fundamental in quantum gravity. And so why do, I, why do I say this when you ask me about time inside a black hole? Because if the inside of a black hole is ruled by some quantum gravity mess and what's then this quantum gravity mess at the end of the day is just whatever is fundamental in quantum gravity, then no, um, there's no time there because time is something which is emergent from quantum gravity, same way that your desk is emerging from these molecules. Now, of course, it depends on where quantum gravity becomes important inside a black hole. How long do you have to wait inside the black hole? How close do you have to be to the singularity before quantum gravity is important? Maybe it becomes important right at the event horizon, or maybe you have to wait a very long time. But eventually, if uh, our current understanding of the way that space and time behave in quantum gravity is correct, then time ceases to, time as we know it ceases to exist. Right, so, um, yeah, I noticed there's a, uh, there's a question on chat by ah. Ken Rosenblum. Uh, Ken, do you want to ask that question in person? Is Ken here? Ken Rosenblum? Um, yeah, maybe I can read the question, but I don't quite understand the question myself. <laughs> so I'm not sure how. Um, so I have often, yeah, yeah, maybe I just read the uh, Ken Rosenblum's question. I have often seen curved space time represented by two dimensional surfaces. That is the surface of a cone when space time is curved further by a nearby mass. What exists where the space time was before it became, it was further curved? Um, so I would say that uh, it, it's maybe analogous to asking the question, uh, if the universe is all there is, what's outside of the universe? And, uh, and the answer is nothing. So what, uh, what this means here is, so we, we draw these pictures. These, as you say, these, these two-dimensional surfaces, uh, like the one I have behind me, but these are really uh, illustrations. Space and space time itself, uh, at least what we observe in the universe is four-dimensional, maybe it's 10-dimensional, as string theory would say, or 11-dimensional, as M-theory would say. But um, it isn't that 
you take space-time, you curve it in some way, and it becomes this two-dimensional surface. Space-time itself is dynamical, and it moves and changes to accommodate the, uh, the, the motion of bodies within it. So it sort of goes back and forth uh, in the sense that these, uh, these large masses affect space-time, and, and conversely, space-time also rules the way that those large masses behave. I hope that this answers the question. I'm not sure it did. Okay, other questions? Um, yeah, I saw two hands. Okay, so one by David Allen. I'll let Mr. Horner go first. Just a clarification on entanglement. I thought originally entanglement was described with, with particles of the same charge. In your example, you had opposite charges. Uh, entanglement does not, okay. sorry, please, please finish. Yeah. That, that was, I was interrupting you, sorry. Just, did you finish your question or? Yeah, I thought entanglement, entanglement was originally described with charges, particles of the same charge, and you were illustrating entanglement with opposite polarities of some kind. Yeah, so uh, I, it's true that the canonical example that people usually use is uh, a uh, an electron and a, and a positron maybe, but entanglement is independent of, uh, of charge. Charge is something that particles often happen to have, but entanglement is a different property altogether. So, David Evan, you want to ask your question? Yes. Uh, actually, two questions. Do we have any sense about when in the history of the universe since the Big Bang, approximately 14 and a half billion years ago, that mass secreted enough to form during that history time the first black, black hole? Uh, so, sorry, I, can you just repeat the question? You were cut off for a moment there. Sorry Do about we, that. Do we have any sense of when in the evolution of the universe in the last four to five billion years, um, the, the um, first black hole appeared? Oh, um, I don't have the number actually off the top of my head. Uh, not a, I'm not an astrophysicist, but I'm sure that um, the information exists at least to our best estimates uh, right now. I think there's probably some question about that. Uh, we may get some in, so some new insights on this, depending on uh, this uh, on the uh, gravitational wave experiment. LIGO may give us some more additional insights on that kind of question. My second question concerns what happens if you have photons decaying at the boundary uh, of the black hole into um, particles and antiparticles. Is there any sense that the Antiparticles might preferentially be absorbed in the black hole, and this might offer some mechanism for the asymmetry in the particle antiparticle real universe. Uh, so you're, you're essentially asking if I have a, a is it preferential for if I correct me if I don't understand your question, but I think you're asking if this is it preferential if you have this uh, these pairs of particles that are popping in, is it preferential for the say the positron? to go into the black hole and the electron to come out of it? Is that the, roughly the question? Um, that's, the, that's an example, that's one example. Um, so uh, I would say the answer is no. Uh, it really doesn't matter um, which one goes in and which one uh, comes out at the end of the day. It's, uh, it's, really, all, uh, it's really just about, um, about the entanglement at the end of the day. It doesn't really matter what type of charge they have or whether it's matter or antimatter. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, I saw a question by Giovanni earlier. Giovanni, do you still want to ask a question? Um, yeah, maybe let's... Yeah, since we're already at 6.30, uh, maybe last question. Uh, uh, maybe I pick somebody who have asked, not asked before. Uh, George Newell? You had uh, talked earlier about uh, the theory of one wormhole um, through space and another wormhole through time. Uh, my understanding of relativity is that space-time is one entity. Um, so that 
that would seem there's a contradiction there somewhere. So could you talk about that a little more, please? Yes, yeah. sure. Um, so it is true that space time is, uh, you can't really split space time, space and time from uh, space from time. So, uh, but it is nonetheless also true that time appears, to, that time moves forward and uh, space, well, you can move left and you can move right and you can move backwards and forwards. And so there is, there is a preferential distinction to the general idea of time. Now, specifically speaking, what, what does that mean? It means that time always has to move forward, but the way in which it moves forward can be heavily affected by what space is doing. It does, however, mean that there is a, always a key distinction between future and past, while there isn't between left and right. And that is what makes us able to distinguish, distinguish between a spatial wormhole and a space-time wormhole. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so um, so we are out of time. Uh, so let's thank Letta again for uh, for great lecture, and thanks everybody for um, yeah for coming and for asking so many good questions. Uh, so yeah, hope to see you at Aspen talk again. Thank you all for your attention. Mm-hmm.